so good morning one and all and thank you aios for giving the opportunity to conduct an ic so the ic name of the ic is pot puree of retina so in this we would be managing uh, challenging retinal disorders medical and surgical retina which would be presented by uh, uh, colleagues and co-colleagues uh, this is a unique uh, case managed by uh, young minds and discussion would be our experts with uh, uh, Dr. A. S. Kuru Prasad, uh, who is a mentor uh, for all of us and a very senior colleague. And uh, uh, our other panelist is uh, and our other panelist is uh, Dr. Naresh Yadav. He is a senior consultant at Naran Netrale, again mentor for uh, most of us over here. So the first case uh, would be presented by uh, Dr. Mohit. Uh, he is a senior associate uh, at uh, PGI Chandigarh and my dear colleague. So uh, good morning, Mohit, and <laughs> let's begin. Thank you, Divyansh, for the opportunity and invitation to be a part of this uh, IC. Uh, after uh, quite a night out in Mumbai on Saturday, being here early morning, if I'm stuttering, stammering, and disoriented more than usual, I'm going to do that at the outset. So uh, we're going to go with two cases, um, uh, and you know, one of them is a medical one, the other one being a surgical one, and uh, uh, as, uh, you know, whatever the if you want, you just stop after the first, or you know, at the end. You're the boss, absolutely. So the first one is a, is a surgical retina case, and uh, you know here it goes. It was a, it was a, yeah, so a 31-year-old male had complained of insidious onset decreasing vision in the right eye for two months, and was referred as a case of a choroidal mass with exudative retinal detachment. Had a, <coughs> had a visual acuity of 6 by 60. It was fluctuating. The intraocular pressure was normal. Uh, there was no re relative afferent pupillary defect. The anterior segment, posterior segment, and you know, all of the other examination were essentially normal. However, there was a sentinel episcleral vessel in the upper nasal quadrant, for, for which I do not have a photo. That's the ultra wide field uh, photo of the right eye, and you can see that uh, you know, although the ultra, the multicolored for, you know imaging is not the best to comment on the uh, color, but I would request you to trust me when I say that this was a pigmented mass in the upper nasal quadrant. And you, you know you can see the exudative retinal detachment there inferiorly. The details of the mass were as such. So on ultra so on ultrasonography, it was you know uh, the, it was it, the margins were well defined, and you can see the typical angle you know positive angle kappa. Uh, the base measured 7.45 millimeters. The, the the maximum height was uh, you know 8.9 millimeters. And uh, I don't think there was much doubt as, as to what this actually was, at least based on the clinical exam and the ultrasonography. Uh, the patient was carrying a MRI of the orbit. It's not something that we got done, but the patient had this. And, this, and the lesion was T1, was hyper intense on T1 and hyper intense on, on T2. Also had surrounding scleral enhancement. And uh, even the radiology report that the patient was carrying uh, you know, suggested that it was most likely a choroidal melanoma. Uh, we got these systemic investigations done you know, to, to look at, uh, you, you know, which is generally our protocol to look at the ultrasound, the chest, and you know, perform your blood, blood investigations just to try and rule out any gross evidence of systemic me <coughs> metastasis, none of which was forthcoming. And subsequently, we discussed with the patient the, the, the various treatment options. I, I will come to that then after I play the video. Uh, and then try and justify, uh, if I can, as to why we chose to do what we did. So eventually, this patient was planned for a pass plantar vitreous surgery and endoresection of the tumor. Uh, as I said, once I played the surgical video, before I before the question slide, I'll try and uh, you know justify my choice of the same. And this is how the surgery actually went. So you you can see that uh, since the patient was phakic. And that was the uh, left eye. It was, uh, there was an upper nasal mass you can, you can actually see there. So making the ports in the standard way was difficult because your upper nasal port would have gone through the uh, you know, lesion. It might have gone through or you might have had to touch the lens. So I, I shifted temporally. So this is, this is now me you know, sitting temporally. You can see by the change in position of the uh, speculum. And uh, you know, from there on, I treated this like as if I am, I am sitting superiorly and, you know, uh, 
did my ports the regular way as I would. So what that meant was that uh, both my both both the hands with the endolite and the active port were not in the uh, the quadrant of the tumor. Was the exudative RD patient was prone, you know, all of the fluid went posteriorly. Uh, so that's what the patient had. That's the uh, appearance of the uh, retina and that and that tumor. We put in some, uh, you know. Triumph, triumph, triumph Cinelone to try and get the, the hyaloid off of the disc. Put in some PFCL. That all that also just to reconfirm that this was an exudative RD. We just I just wanted to support the posterior pole before I uh, you know went about uh, tackling the tumor per se uh, because I didn't want anything that was happening blood pigment whatever going into the bacula. So that was that. That was the, the so that so that's the tumor. That was the height. Uh, I, I uh, looked at, uh, you know, the, my choice of this area where I wanted to access this and cut the retina open was the highest point and something which was kind of equator to mid-equatorial so that I could access both the anterior and posterior aspects of it. So after doing a near confluent cautery, uh, I just went anterior and uh, with, you know, care to involve the major vessels, I went on to then... Uh, eat away the choroidal melanoma. This was 25 gauge cutter system. The vitreous, uh, the cutting efficiency, the, the, sorry, the, the cutting speed was gotten down to 2,500 cuts per minute. The intraocular pressure was up to 100 millimeters of mercury uh, with, of course, the, the, the machine giving us a count of the minute every time, but the sisters, the, the scrub uh, nurse was giving us a count of the time after every 30 seconds. That 30 seconds are up, 30 seconds are up because uh, we all know what we can do uh, to the optic nerve and the retina with that kind of pressure for any length of time. Surprisingly, it was easy to get this tumor out. And as you could see, uh, you know, the actual tumor, the breach in the brux, and you know, when it actually popped out into the subretinal space was actually that, that small, uh, as you can see uh, in the periphery. Um, so after getting all of that, then I got down to the task, which to, to the main task at hand, which was to get down to the bare sclera all around and a two millimeter rim. Uh, you know, uh, the, uh, next to that also, uh, which is when the bleeding tends to happen, which is also the time when the uh, surgical video tends to get poorer and the image also tends to get pure, poorer because of your intraocular pressure being very, very high, and which is also the time when your uh, when your heart is pounding like crazy and you being you being someone as daft as me would put your foot on the recording system and ensure that the recording stops now. And that's why after that happened, so yeah, so uh, after that, uh, so, so, so that is where I was, I was pretty much able to get to after which the recording stopped. But I'll quickly give you what the, sorry. Yeah, so um, the, I mean, I had to debride the coronal epithelium. I actually went ahead and put a 277 segmental element in that area, uh, two, a 214, uh, you know, in the encirclage, did a double freeze thaw cryo all around the margins of the two millimeter sclera that I had, I had excised and was very, very clear that a direct PFCL silicone oil exchange had to be done and all the sclerotomies were sutured. Uh, that's what the patient had. This is post-op day five. I mean, the, the vision was fine. I was just uh, glad that, you know, the, the retina remained attached at this point in time and, uh, you know, the bleed wasn't there, which was coming into the AC or whatever. So, so it remained like that. The patient's been doing fine now. Uh, I have nine months of follow-up on this patient. This patient, as far as the anatomic, uh, uh, you know, response is concerned, is doing fine. There is no semblance of a local recurrence at this point in time. This patient, however, does have a, a small subfovial PFCL bubble, which uh, I'd, I'd actually told him that we need to get the oil out and we'll try and attempt to get this out as well. But he's just very reluctant to get a surgery done. He's happy with what he has. Uh, and uh, that's that. So uh, my question, so, uh, before I post, pose, my, pose my questions, just, you know, uh, uh, maybe a minute as to why I chose to go with this option. Given that uh, the height of the tumor was 8.9 millimeters, and the fact that the only brachytherapy available, to my knowledge, in our neck of the woods is, is non-iodine-based plaque therapy, which is ruthenium-based. And, you know, with that, the, <clears throat> the textbook would tell you that anything up to 5 millimeters height is ideal. If you're really pushing it five to seven, maybe 7.58 millimeters is what you can do, Com you know, combine it with TTT or whatever. Anytime you tend to get above eight millimeters, and even that might be pushing it, uh, is when uh, the plaque therapy, which is ruthenium-based, which is what we tend to have, 
in our country will not, not be as beneficial because it, it, then it's going to pretty much act like radiotherapy. It's going to cause collateral damage. You're going to have radiation retinopathy, radiation optic neuropathy. Um, the second thing was, at least in my mind, I'm not aware of any place uh, of, you know, which, which is going to offer proton beam therapy. And uh, uh, that was that. Uh, so the, the, the third, um, uh, I mean, the, the third option, which was the, the, the least preferred, but the only one available, at least as far as I was concerned for this patient, was to resect this, whether to go in internally or externally is something that I'd like to uh, get the, uh, the opinion of the, of, the, of, the, of the panelists. And the other thing was that should the endoresection, if, uh, you know, it was done, should it have been done similarly or, or, you know, we should have actually put a plaque on top of it at the end to prevent any local recurrence, uh, at least in the uh, near uh, foreseeable future. Let's say, I think, excellent case, I think you have managed it correctly. So, if plaque, if plaque was there, I think combination would have been the ideal. I don't think exo water, the external resection is possible. It's quite posterior. It is mainly for anterior tumors involving ciliary body and all. So, surgery is fine. Then. But I, just, I have not really done this, but uh, earlier we used to use endocryo. So I think the edges, the posterior edges, I don't think you could have reached with the external cryo. You could have treated the edges anteriorly, but if you could have used that endocryo and treated the posterior edges, that could have been... But so I'm not sure whether it's available now or not. We have it. The, have I mean, they, 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 they gave it, the, the upper people give it as a separate attachment if you okay. ask for it. So we have it. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, um, that's a good suggestion, sir. Quite frankly, it didn't come to my mind in, the, in, in this case. No personal experience, but I think it was a very well managed. Uh, I'm seeing this for the first time. I've just seen these in YouTube videos, and uh, 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 just one concern is that when you do the uh, endo resection with the cutter, uh, there is a possibility that a lot of uh, particles can drop subretinally, sub posterior, and migrate posteriorly as well. So, uh, is it a good idea to fill up with PFCL till the edge of the retinectomy and? Uh, Yes, so, than yes sir, that was also a thought that crossed my mind. My only thing was that with the IOPM being as high, <clears throat> being as high as we, so in a PSCL field, I, normally our pressure would be lower in for any other indication. However, in this, we had to go all the way up to 100 because, so with the PFCL, had we filled it any, you know, beyond the margin that I did, so I f did fill it up to the arcade, sir, but uh, had we filled it further, I think, uh, for me to gauge whatever pressure uh, was in the eye and what, what you know insult I was causing to the uh, uh, retina and the uh, uh, you know optic disc as a consequence of that was difficult. So I tried to kind of hedge my bets and have a little bit of uh, PFCL in, but of course not the way up to the uh, up to the edge because the pressure needed to be kept very high for the bleeding to be stopped during that endoresection uh, five and a half minutes that this. Uh, that, that that step of surgery lasted, sir. But and uh, uh, was not the dome of the tumor obscuring the posterior border? You just cauterized uh, where uh, where it was maximum prominent. Uh, absolutely, prominent. sir. So but the, but yeah. I but I believe uh, and and also which is known from histopathology that uh, the the appearance of the tumor that typical mushroom shaped. So the breach in the brux and the RPE when it actually pops out is actually a lot smaller than what we tend to see at the end because we tend to look at that, but the posterior end is actually small, which was also seen in. Uh, that's why I was, uh, again, hoping, but based on uh, some kind of uh, that, that, you know, the entire sclera there would not be kind of the area where the tumor came out from. That's why I thought the highest edge is where I would go, kind of open out the retina like that, so that I have access to the tumor, get all the tumor out, and then that would be, be like a relatively posterior giant tear, and then okay. I'll be able to settle it back. And uh, what is the follow-up you have? Uh, Nine months, sir. So I've done two. This, is, this was my first. I just did a, a recent second one. That was... Uh, even more posterior. So that was, uh, in that, it, I mean, the optic disc was being obscured by the, uh, by the shape of that tumor. So and if I have a follow-up of two months on that, so not longer than that. Excellent, excellent case. This was uh, under local anesthesia, and I will not do it under local again, sir. My second case was under general anesthesia, and uh, the, yeah, that was the. The issue is uh, because uh, some people recommend you could use hypotensive anesthesia, but that is more recommended, I believe, if, if, if one needs to excise this externally, because there is no other way to then, uh, you know, tamponade bleeding. But with a closed system, 100 millimeters of mercury pressure, uh, bleeding is an issue, but it is not something that, uh, I'd say a really bad diabetic that we do for surgery without a pre-op antivirus would bleed a little more than what this eventually ended up bleeding, sir.
So just comments by, because we have seen sir doing cases, so two, three, as sir was suggesting, hypotensive anesthesia helps because uh, retinal bleeders would get controlled by this, but the choroidal ones, when we go deep and because we want the choroid also to be out and we want a bare sclera, Absolutely. that's when the problem occurs. And yeah. there, all those bleeders, as you could see, was bleeding significantly. It even occurs in an hypotensive anesthesia, but the chance is much lesser because at that time you would raise the pressure not at 100, but 60 itself would be good enough. So that is one. Second, belt buckle and SB, why? Because if there is a recurrence, the options left are brachy and the second option left is TTT. Yeah. So brachy would be out of the question because then we have to explant Perfect. the buckle or the segment and then do it. So Agreed. In, Agreed. So Agreed. And because of the fibrosis, again, a lot of dissection. So that is one thing. And then Agreed. the more conjunctiva we are opening, the chance of cells migrating okay. from the port side into the orbital space and then it would become a extraocular tumor and much more yeah. an issue. Agreed. And you had Agreed. done cryo, that's, Agreed. that's very, uh, very uh, good of it. Uh, one more uh, uh, suggestion was to either pre-treat it. Pre-treat means what that you make a scar at that tumor site. How we make a scar is Either we do a uh, brachy so that there is a uh, scarring at the site of the tumor so that the retina is little less detached. With the dosing of, I mean, yeah. taking it to be about six, yes. I mean, eight, yeah. uh, what do you… Uh, so, uh, so, as we have ruthenium, we do not have iodine plaque, but still ruthenium works till six mm. Beyond six, it's a sandwich therapy. Yeah. So, we add six plus two mm of uh, your TTT. But then we can do, right, right now there are publications where they are doing double brachytherapy. So staged brachytherapy. So first you treat for four and then once the tumor is le of a lesser size, because we know three months later, whatever is six, it would become to at least four or 4.5. Then you again do a brachy mm -hmm. for that. And then, so finally, because this is a Domato, uh, 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 Domato's yes. publications which he started with. Yeah. We had a case of his which had had an extraocular extension. So we couldn't even do an enucleation in that. And he, he passed away within three months. So the problem is not that we are doing a surgery and it comes out. It's, it's the uh, tumor itself. And Absolutely. the biggest advantage of doing such is if we do a genetic analysis to identify whether it is type A or type B. So, 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 so didn't do it for this, have yeah, done, it for the, done it for the, done it for the second one. In fact, good. I've asked for the, uh, you know, the GNAP and BAP yes, mutation, all yes, of that. Yes. Uh, the, Med genome people weren't willing, I mean, I, I actually told them, you can do it from sample. Se. So, uh, they're sitting on it. They haven't said no, and I'm hoping they'll be able to give me. But for this, I did not do it. So, so that my bad. prognosticate, because if it's type 2 A and B, the, the chance of... Absolutely. Uh, yeah, Absolutely. Kind of Absolutely. So very good presentation. Very nice video, sir. Thank you. Uh, so I just have one query, like, uh, uh, would you consider a vortex vein ligation prior to surgery so that it may theoretically prevent uh, uh, dissemination of uh, the tumor through the circulation? Well, I'd like to believe that uh, if it's spreading through the vein, I'm happy. I'm pretty sure it goes into, you know, once, once we start cutting into that, I'm pretty sure the exposed what edges or whatever, long posterior ciliary, ciliary arteries and all of those are through which it's actually getting into it. If it's getting into that vein and going, I'm pretty sure it's, uh, uh, you know. But the actually, uh, the vortex vein is in direct connection with the choroid and with the tumor. It's all the time, uh, all the time it's, uh, you know, conveying the uh, metastasis out of the eye to the rest of the body. So, uh, there are, uh, it, it's even like there are a few publications in which they say that uh, it's not true, and, but uh, theoretically they say that when we are opening it, when, when we are opening the tumor, when we are making so much of, uh, like when we are breaching that, uh, that tumor dissemination through the uh, circulation would be more is a theoretical explanation. I think. So what I'd like to say to that is, if I so the the larger series as um, you know and and the big if I can call the daddy of this is Doctor you know Domato from uh, England, and you know Doctor Folds prior to him. So it was basically their school of thought, and they've kept this up. I mean there are other groups doing it. Doctor Garcia does it in in Spain, and he you know sometimes combines a plaque and sometimes doesn't. The two largest series, I think 70 plus patients of Doctor Domato, and I think 28 some patients of Doctor. Jose Rumi Garcia. I think two things, if you were to look at local recurrence and systemic, uh, you know, disease. So that's, that, you know, those are your, are your two, two concerns. It, it's going to either come back in the eye or around the eye or it's going to increase meds. 
So in the 72 patients that uh, Dr. Domato had, he had three patients of local recurrence over a mean follow-up of 6.2 years. Which to me, uh, and of course that's the paper I read left, right, center, and then tried to do the same again before I did any of this, uh, was looking at that. Of course their 72 patients at a very busy oncology center were over 16 years. So their choice of doing this, it's not like they look at a posterior tumor and they tend to do it. It's very you know, guarded and they look at what the height of the tumor is and whatnot, and then they tend to go about it. But the results in their series over a long period of time were very encouraging as far as local tumor-free interval and systemic METs because of your surgery were concerned. And adding to what Divancer was mentioning, gene expression profiling is uh, single, uh, single gene expression profiling is what is uh, recommended uh, currently. Tell me who will do it, I'll send it to them. India may not be able to do it. I'll tell you, I'll tell you. Uh, I'll, be, I'll be very happy to send it to anybody if we have that. So, as Dr. Prithvi Mitunjai suggests that if we do, so that we can prognosticate for the patient so that, because finally, see, it's a tumor and it may. Absolutely, be absolutely, better. absolutely. So, one more small suggestion that if we could have added some more laser onto the choroid which is remaining. Means doing a red or a green doesn't matter because interop you have removed 90% of it. So you you must have done. So I, I did a, I did a double freeze thaw cryo all around. Uh, I treated okay, all after around. I okay. did all of that. Actually, yeah. wait, my sure. I, I, I unfortunately stepped on the video recording of that. So the after that I don't have that PSL all exchange and cryo wala part. Unfortunately, my bad. Sure. But I did uh, you know did a double freeze thaw cryo all around that uh, kind of site where I'd gotten the bears clara. <laughs> So, I would ask Mohit to uh, reserve his second case and then uh, I, I would ask my other colleague, uh, Dr. Sharad, to present his next case. Sharad, shall we? Yeah. So, Sharad is working at Prasad Netralaya and a very good friend from LVPI. So after having this such a interesting surgical retina case, I'm just presenting one medical retina case. <laughs> but seeing the surgical retina is very interesting, but not doing it. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so by far, if I see it, yes, it looks good, but I never try that. <laughs> yes. So I'm just thankful for giving the opportunity. So, my 33-year-old 30, male patient who came with sudden onset diminution of vision in the both eyes since one week, he had a high-grade fever and vomiting for one week for which he was admitted in the government hospital and he didn't have any history of diabetic or hypertension part of it. His right eye uh, vision was 20 finger 1 meters in the same as in the left eye. Vision IOP was 24 and 22 in the right and left. In the anterior segment, when you see in the right eye, he had a pupillary membrane with uh, AC cells 4 plus and the posterior sinaic which was present and there were some pigments on the lens was there and RL cells also present in the right eye. Left eye has such there is no inflammatory markers or not there. And when you see the posterior segment, there are like mild vitreous haze was there along with that optitis was looking okay. There was mild dilatation of the venules was seen. The few flame-shaped and interretinal hemorrhages are also noted. Along with that, there was exudated retinal detachment on the posterior pole. And this is the same thing which can be seen in the left eye also. And in the periphery, in the both eyes, there was choroidal detachment. At around 270, 270 degrees of choroidal detachment was noted in the both eyes. So when I did a, went to the fluorescent angiography, there was some amount of inflammation and disc leakage which can be noted and amount of hyper... Uh, hyperfluorescent areas are also noted which indicates this is an inflammatory pathology which can be seen in the both eyes. So I went on with OCT. In the OCT is like uh, right eye actually in the first visit I didn't get so properly because a lot of uh, exudative detachment was there. So in the left eye it was much better. In the right eye for uh, OCT is of the next uh, uh, next week presentation actually. So th there was a neurosensor detachment and interretinal fluid and RP undulations were all present in the both eyes. So when I did the B scan, there was a thickened retinochoroidal complex with a choroidal detachment of around 270 degrees on the, on the both eyes which was there. So I thought this is a case of bilateral exudative RD with choroidal detachment. 
So now what can be the etiology having the both eyes having the axillary to retinal detachment with caudal detachment? I went through that and I thought it can be an inflammatory VKH, Bessage disease or masquerades or any other infective panivitis. I went ahead with the further investigations. So blood investigation CBC showed neutrophilia but the, uh, the most important investigation which came positive is HIV ELISA which came as positive and the CD4 count he had was 53 millimeter, uh, CD53 cells. Other MON2, VDRL, TPH, everything was negative and the urine culture showed me having the E. coli of more than uh, 10 raised to 5 which is significantly high. And the blood culture was negative because he was already started on uh, uh, intravenous antibiotics, high, uh, broad spectrum and it, it came negative. So based on this, when I went to certain literatures and all, then I came into the diagnosis of bilateral exudative RD with CD due to septicemia. Because there are certain cases which shows the septicemia and the increase in the E. coli will cause the inflammation and can lead to cordial detachment and retinal detachment. Most of the time it should be endogenous end of what we see having a lot of vitreitis and retinitis part of it. But it looks certain different. Um, only the positive treatment uh, uh, investigation report which I got was the urine culture and HIV positivity. So, he was continued for intravenous ceftriazone 1 gram 12th hourly and I started on topical steroids and top, topical cyclopagics and he was referred to AIT center for the further management of the HIV. So on follow up on these medications is uh, systemic, uh, uh, he, uh, he had system, a lot of fever and all which got recovered and uh, follow up his visual acuity improved to 636 and uh, right eye and 6 by 9 in the left eye. Fundus there was exudative retinal detachment and caudal detachment recovered with hemorrhages are still recovering. The, the vessels and all which are dilated and also has been recovering part of it. Now he came, the, actually last, before I leave the, come to, coming to the conference, he came for the follow up and he was 6 by 6 in the both eyes and he was doing literally well. In the AIT center they have started the medication for AIT and CD4 count has also become better, now around 90 something. So this is the last follow up which was shown, the, all the exudative detachment has recovered. So, in this point, I thought it can be due to septicemia and in my point of view, the reason for having the cordial detachment with retinal detachment can be because of two things. One, can it be the infection per se or second, it can be a, because the patient had severe fever and uh, excessive vomiting. This excessive vomiting would have caused ciliary body shutdown and having a severe ocular hypotony which should have been lead to the cordial detachment part of it. So this is a one more case report, when I went through the case reports, I got only one case report where in this case they went ahead with the vitrectomy because intravenous antibiotics didn't work. So they went ahead with the vitrectomy and then uh, in the vitreous culture they saw they had a E. coli positivity. So in my case it recovered medically so no need for any doing to go into surgical part of it. So just my questions are what can be the probable diagnosis, any other investigations or how do you manage this case in a different way. Yeah, thank you. Yes, sir. Was high. High. 24 but, uh, and But you postulate that hypotony could be the cause of the choroidal detachments. Yes, he had come maybe uh, after the sudden vomiting and all would have been caused a sudden hypotony. Afterwards, when there is a detachment occurred, by the time he reached to me, it was almost a one week post uh, vomiting and all. It would have been recovered. That my hypothesis actually. Uh, all the other uh, features could be explained by the septicemia and the E. coli related events, but the choroidal detachment somehow yes. I am not able to figure out any that's thoughts the, uh, on… Reason for me. That's the, that was my hypothesis why the choroidal detachment is. Inflammatory choroiditis also is a possibility. Yes. Choroidal effusion. Okay. I think people have said that immune complexes get deposited, it's sort of local infarction, transliminal pressure can build up and that can cause trans transudation. Transudation. Okay. Yeah, I just wanted to ask whether you did AC tap in your case because the minute you had septicemia as uh, your on the blood investigations, mm -hmm. did you go and do an AC tap and see whether you are finding the same organism which is growing on the culture? So actually I didn't do that because when the patient came, he was came in a wheelchair. He was like very, you know, lot of uh, not uh, feeling well very much. And first I thought, I didn't come into mind first actually it is endogenous end of thermitis or any septicemia part of it because I've never seen having a bilateral caudal detachment before. 
So what I thought, I'll send the initial investigations and let him come by uh, two to three days. Then I will plan for maybe vitreous biopsy only I would have planned for. By the time he came, he was becoming better. So I just I didn't go anything. Steroids, you didn't give steroids. I steroids. Steroids are given only topical steroids. Oral steroids because he has a retropositive, CD4.53. And is there any connection between retropositivity and this one? No idea. No, those hemorrhages could have also been either endotoxin related because of the E. coli itself or Septicemia even because of the microangiopathy which happens because of the HIV virus. Yeah. So, so those hemorrhages and the cotton wool spots. Cotton, cotton wool spots are not, not there wool spots, actually. You hemorrhages and vessel dil dilatation was there. Yes, 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 so those be could there. be because of the microangiopathy Maybe, process yeah. itself. Yes. But has only the leads to dilatation of the veins and hemorrhages also is very common. Yeah, as Kumar sir was saying, I don't know why. Now the when when we checked, it was 24 and 22 when he came for the first time, but still. <laughs> Actually, nothing I observation I did. That's the good that's thing. Okay. <laughs> yeah, that's the management worked. <laughs> yes. <laughs> that is. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> the only other point which probably if you had a bilateral exudative RD with a choroidal detachment, initially itself doing an ICG also helps you to rule out the other inflammatory causes as well at the okay. first instance. Mm -hmm. Just limiting yourself to a fluorescene doesn't... I didn't have uh, access to ICG. Yeah, maybe. But but doing an ICG also Good helps to rule out all your other choroidal causes. So, uh, thank you, Sharad. Very intriguing case. So, one hard thumping case and second intriguing case. <laughs> so, I would call my other uh, colleague, uh, Dr. Pradeep, who is a consultant at uh, Shankara Hospital, Shimoga. Yeah. And thank you all for participating so enthusiastically in a morning session <laughs> and on the last day of the AIOS. Thank you. Very good morning, one and all. I would like to thank uh, Dr. I would like to thank Dr. Divyansh and uh, the moderators for giving you this opportunity. Uh, I'll be presenting a case uh, which, uh, because of an obvious mistake, uh, maybe like I ended up in a lot of problems. So it was a 58-year-old uh, gentleman with a blurred vision in left eye since 15 days. He was a known diabetic since four years and was on uh, regular therapy. Uh, he had a history of uh, fever six weeks ago. It was for a 10 days duration. Nasal swab was uh, done and the RT-PCR was uh, positive for COVID-19. Chest X-ray showed bilateral multifocal peripheral patchy ground opacities. He was treated with remdesivir, low molecular weight heparin and dexamethasone oral for one month. His best corrected visual acuity in the right eye was 6.9, in the left eye 6.60. He was pseudo -fakic. in the right eye the anterior chamber was quiet, in the left eye there were one plus cells. So this is the fundus photography of the right eye. Here we can see that there is there are multifocal retinitis. We can see at multiple areas, we can see the patches of retinitis and they were predominantly in the perivascular area. So this was the left eye where we can see a dense vitreitis and we can see that there is a peripapillary and uh, macular retinitis. The visibility was poor due to the dense vitreitis. So the provisional diagnosis like was bilateral retinitis but the etiology was something that we were looking at. Uh, the blood counts were relatively were normal. The ESR is 5 mm. Uh, the dengue, chikungunya, EBV, IgG, IgM were negative. CMV, HSV, 1, 2, VZV, only IgG was positive, but IgM was negative. Wheel Felix was also negative. So HIV, VDRL, TPHA, Toxo, IgG, IgM were negative. Montu was more than 15 mm, but HRCT was negative for TB, Quantiferon was negative, pulmonology opinion was solved, who told that there was no evidence of uh, uh, pulmonary tuberculosis. A provisional diagnosis of a post-fever, uh, post-viral retinitis with uh, atypical features was considered. And uh, we considered only an oral prednisolone, uh, 1 mg per kg, and he was monitored with uh, endocrinologist for his blood sugars. After three days, we could see that there was an increase in the size of uh, the retinitis. Though there is a posterior, the central clearing is there, but it's expanding in the edges. And the vitreous head has, haze had increased in the right eye. Uh, this is the nasal lesion. Again, here we can see that there is an, in, uh, it's growing closer towards the optic disc. 
in the left eye we could not make out much difference as such so in view of worsening uh, we stopped the steroids and considered a uh, uh, provisional diagnosis of non necrotizing herpetic retinitis uh, started on valacyclovir 1 gram 3 times uh, sent ac ac tab for pcr but the pcr was negative for hsv vzv cmb mycobacterium tuberculosis and toxoplasma 3 days post valacyclovir again there is an increase in vitritis and in the vitreous actually uh, there is increase in the retinitis also it was expanding it was going close to the fovea as we can see over here in the right eye and in the left eye also we could see that this size was increasing though the close to the optic disc it is somewhat cleared but at the edges it is increasing uh, there were vitreous uh, snowball like opacities in this time we could see that there were uh, some snowball opacities in a string like uh, in a string of pearl like appearance in both the eyes at this time stopped valcyclovir considering the possibility of a fungal retinitis which is described uh, in the literature uh, so based on mainly because of the presence of this string of pearls in vitreous and at that time there were multiple reports of mucormycosis post covid so there was this postulate that they are more predisposed to uh, fungal infection so that was one more uh, uh, point in favor considered a left eye parspina vitrectomy with intravitreal oriconazole amphotericin b and vitreous biopsy there was an inferior iatrogenic break so in silicon oil tamponade was considered as we needed a clear media for uh, further assessing the progress of the lesion so the two days uh, we even started in one oral uh, oriconazole the vitreous biopsy showed pus cells but gram stain koh mount back koh mount bacterial and fungal culture were negative pcr was negative for covid so this was post uh, anti fungal two days in the right eye there is uh, a continued expansion of the retinitis in the left eye in, in the, the the one which was close to fovea was also showing an increase in retinitis this was the left eye post surgery we can see that the retinitis this was like uh, 12 hours after ppv and this is two days after uh, the commencing the anti fungal therapy so we can see that this edge actually still increased though posteriorly it was decreasing in the periphery it continued to increase and there was a retinal infarct in the inferior half of the macula so it was like we had already tried antiviral anti fungal mm. so i just took uh, two three opinions and uh, everyone suggested there's nothing wrong in giving in bacterial you can just try once though there's no evidence till now uh, we are already losing one eye and the other eye the lesion is going close to the fovea so in a desperate attempt started with left eye intravitreal piperacillin tazobactam and vancomycin and intravenous vancomycin piperacillin tazobactam and doxycycline 100 mg pd uh, two days two days anti two dose two days post antibacterial the retinitis started fading we can see that the retinitis was reducing in size here it was fading in the left eye also like these lesions were uh, slowly regressing and we continued intravitreal antibiotics every 48 hours in the left eye for 10 days and intravenous antibiotic for 14 days doxycycline was continued for one month this is seven days post antibacterial we can see that the retinitis is significantly regressed in the right eye here we can see uh, okay yeah this is a three month follow up we can see that there is still a persistent retinitis like persistent whitening i don't say retinitis there is persistent whitening and we can see this hemorrhage around it we had stopped all therapy like almost two months before this but still this was there i again thought like uh, shall i give doxycycline i consulted and uh, uh, told to just follow up closely every weekly that's what we thought from here uh, left eye the lesion was completely regressed and uh, silicon oil removal was planned this is eight months follow up uh, we were actually seeing every weekly for almost one to two months then every two weeks then every monthly this whitening is still somewhat present even there uh, and the left eye was uh, not showing any evidence of any activity uh, so we went to the went back into the literature like um, there are uh, two reports of endogenous bacterial retinitis uh, like um, but uh, it was in an immunocompromised patient and in in the in a two of those cases in one case uh, they could not get anything positive even the biopsy everything was negative in one case it was uh, uh, positive uh, so the questions which remain unsolved are is it really a bacterial retinitis or what really worked i am not sure till now and whether that persistent whitening is indicative of a dormant infection should we like do anything to it or like it's almost eight months now 
just wait. Yeah, this is, I think, typical of the ricket sale that we see very often. Of course, the wheel Felix was negative. Uh, the first slide showed that wheel Felix was negative. Well, Not we good. usually get wheel flex positivity and we start the patient first thing on dimox, uh, uh, sorry, doxy. Doxy, uh, doxy is something that we think is the panacea for all these post-viral fever retinitis and it usually works very well. Uh, fifth day after starting doxy, we start the patient on oral steroids. And uh, I think um, you are probably biased by the, uh, the concurrent, uh, you know, COVID and the mycormycosis that was going on at that time. Otherwise, probably you would have also started in the, on doxy at the first oh, yeah, go. Like, uh, uh, I even start doxycycline for all the cases of post yeah. retinitis. I start for every case. This dense vitritis was something which uh, was not very... Uh, yeah, if I started at that time, I don't know whether if it has resolved with that alone without doing anything of this. Yeah. I'm not uh, sure. This, this the vitritis also is something this which Dense vitritis is something uh, which we don't see and... Uh, we usually see uh, extensive exudation in the terms like there will be an ex for the amount of retinitis what we see the amount of subretinal fluid intraretinal fluid that we see in post viral retinitis is disproportionate we see a lot of edema subretinal fluid but this patient did not had even the oct we have done through these lesions there was no fluid or no edema around it so those are some of the features like which uh, uh, made me think something else than uh, the regular post viral retinitis or whatever we consider probably a post request sale one that was not considered initially. I want to ask everyone if uh, syphilitic uh, retinitis is something that you will consider as a differential diagnosis. Plaque, which presents as plaque, but in this I think uh, the VDRL, TPHA, TPHA were, were negative. negative so uh, like had managed two cases of necrotizing uh, syphilitic retinitis before like before this uh, there was uh, extensive necrosis in the inner retina that's what we had at that time yes sir yes, sir yes, yes. want to like uh, both tpha and vdrl were negative sir fa uh, was not perfect yes, outer retinitis right you can see blood vessels going over them over this and also the nasal one at all points in time, right? Mm, yes, and also in the left eye at the outset, although the media is hazy, yes. but you can see because the, the vessels close to the disc are more prominent, you can see them over, going over them. So whatever this lesion was in both the eyes began as an outer retinitis. This epidemic retinitis or the post fever retinitis begin as isolated re uh, outer retinitis is my question. To my mind, the answer is no. I don't think the doxycycline worked. I don't know what this is, but I don't think this is epidemic or post fever retinitis. You, and if you had the OCT scan, I, I would strongly suggest, uh, you know, to you to you to go to back me, to it. It will uh, tell you that the outer retina was preferentially involved, neither the choroid nor the inner retina. Choroid was not involved, sir. That's I, I definitely the remember the that. The photo The photo Uh, if it is see the inferior nasal retinitis. No, this is uh, sorry, sir. Like uh, this one. Yeah. yeah. Uh, no. No, this was an artifact, sir. Like, sorry, I, this was an artifact. Yeah, this was not there. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I just. Uh. Yeah, the question which I had is that uh, when your retinitis was uh, worsening. Yes. So in post fever retinitis, when you have retinitis worsening, you don't have the lesions which are actually growing more. More you have is the new lesions and the yeah. new lesions. New lesions. And the the subretinal fluid and the intraretinal fluid which you were talking about. So that was not happening in in your particular case. So just by and uh, the location of the retinitis itself. So whatever post fever retinitis I have seen, they are more closer to the optic nerve, very close to the macular region rather than having something very far away around the equatorial region, that's something which is unlikely. So, in, so when we talk about epidemic retinitis, uh, we usually use the word posterior pole retinitis. That is how we call the, it's a posterior pole disease, rather than having it at the equator and slightly beyond it. And also the exudation, and that means exudation in terms of subretinal fluid and intraretinal fluid was not happening, especially when your patient was uh, worsening. I still believe that starting steroids in the beginning without an antibiotic cover was one of the biggest mistakes I have done in this case. I still believe that and maybe like 
I don't I don't remember any case Other in which I would have talked. Other thing is Toxo. also you need to you don't need it probably an AC tap and sending it for PCR. Send it, Toxo. sir. You send it for PCR. AC tap was done for PCR. Toxo was negative. Toxo IgG IgM were negative. Yeah. I have done CD4 count, sir. CD4 count is normal. Have you, I mentioned also CD4 count was normal, actually. Yes, sir. That was also done, sir. Yes, sir. I have done. Dr. Pradeep, what was the, in that literature review which you showed, what was the causative organism in that endogenous bacterial uh, retinitis which you spoke about? Sir, actually they could, uh, the, what they say is the histopathological section showed necrotic retina and uh, uh, they are not sure about the organism. They say that it was, uh, uh, yeah. Yeah, so like uh, they so say that uh, uh, treatment with antibiotic resulted in improved vision in both the patients. That's what they say. And this is also presumed. And secondly is why did you choose Tazobactam Piperacillin as your antibacterial agent instead of starting with the local one of Ancomycin? Uh, I I have to agree that it was like uh, at that time like I didn't want to take a chance. It, it was done. I didn't want to take a chance. Take a yeah, fire it with a well known. Like I should not be feeling that antibacterial didn't work. So I wanted some uh, something which a very broad spectrum and uh, no antibiotic, res lesser antibiotic I resistance. I think anybody would do that because uh, you don't want to, you know, leave anything to chance. You want to do at that time again best. trying ceftriaxone, then re then thinking that okay maybe like antibiotic resistance and again again shifting like it was. It was getting too worse already. The patient's uh, daughter was a doctor by herself and uh, they were very like understanding but still at that time like uh, shifting to one, all, it's, it, it looked crazy to myself giving antiviral, anti antifungal and then antibiotic like. But at least you didn't start everything together, other people just mix and give. So, uh, next Kansha? is Dr. Sriram. Uh, he is yeah. consultant at Shankara Hospital, Panvel, and uh, going to his hometown back to Guntur. <laughs> Good morning, <laughs> everyone. Someday. Thank you, Divyan, sir, for the opportunity. Uh, it will not take much time. So, uh, it's a uh, case when I was in Guntur. A nine year old child was brought by her uh, father with uh, saying that the child is having issues at the school. The child had blurred vision for last one year, but they came after a one year duration. They didn't give any past history of any other previous ophthalmic records. The vision in right eye was 6 by 12 parts and left eye was 6 by 24 with no further improvement. She was a myopic child. Anterior segment was quiet, there was no AC reaction. So uh, the child presented to us in August 2019. This was the fundus appearance. There was no vitritis. The media was clear. There was peripapillary uh, subretinal lesion, yellowish lesion with one margin towards the uh, macula may be active, but clinically it appeared inactive. And we did an OCT. Uh, we can see here a subretinal fibrotic tissue-like structure in both the eyes. Uh, there was no intraretinal lesions in the right eye, but left eye had few cystic changes. We advised uh, father to get uh, evaluated for uh, uveitic profile, but they just ignored. They never turned up with any of the evaluation being done. Then again, because there was further drop of vision, that uh, father again got, uh, got the child in Jan 2020. That was after five months. At this time, the vision in right eye has dropped to 6 by 36 and in the right eye here, we can see mid-peripheral yellowish RPE lesions, which was not there earlier. Again, in the OCT, uh, uh, there was only the predominant lesion was subretinal and no macular edema or CNVM lesion. But what we can see that compared to August 2019, the lesion in the right eye was 
crawling or migrating towards the macula so even now even at this visit the child did not come back again did not get evaluated no treatment nothing i could not start on anything because i don't know what to do like i did not give any steroid i did not give any antibiotic ac was quiet vitreous was quiet only migrating migration of the lesion uh, so in march a uh, child came the vision was 6 by 24 in both eyes uh, and at this time we i convinced the father and we could do a ffa for free of cost like just to identify they were not even willing for any evaluation so this is a montage image uh, where we can see that in addition to the posterior pole lesion in the mid periphery uh, it's superiorly and inferiorly we have fibrotic lesions with multiple rp pigmentary disturbances similarly in the left eye also we can see a fibrotic lesions uh, here and this was the FFA, uh, there is no active leakage, there is staining of the lesions and I could not uh, get uh, periphery FFA images because child was not that cooperative for imaging. So this is the timeline, uh, the child presented to us in August and when, as the few months progressed we can see that the lesion is migrating towards the to fovea in both the eyes and the leading edge is somewhat uh, maybe i don't know the less fibrotic that's why it appears little uh, maybe a different shade of color than the uh, rest of the lesion uh, we sent to an uh, immunologist a rheumatologist and this time they got the child evaluated um, the esr was raised 40 mm in the first hour the rest of the parameters were normal uh, rheumatologist got an ana levels also done which showed a uh, cnk positive and torch analysis was positive only for herpes virus rest of the viral profile was normal even hiv and uh, uh, rest of the tests were normal i didn't add here the rheumatologist called me and said sir i think we should start the child on acyclovir it should benefit the child though i have not seen such case but child was started on acyclovir at this visit in march 2020 i felt that retrolental cells were there and i started on topical fml that's it no oral steroids or anything from November 2020 to Jan 21, the child is on acyclovir and the lesion did not uh, progress further. The lesion was stable. So uh, I just want, this is the imaging from 2019 to 2021. Child has not been on any form of oral steroids or immunosuppressants. The only medication the child got was acyclovir for four months and topical FML. So I just wanted to ask, uh, any experience with such a case and uh, what would they uh, when i searched the literature the closest i came to was a case of progressive subretinal fibrosis uh, there is no uh, diagnostic criteria for such a case no histopathological proof uh, they have one in a uh, deceased patient they had shown a histopathology later on but i cannot confirm the diagnosis by histopathology or anything here like what they have reported was that it is seen in healthy young women. The youngest age they reported was six years. I, here the child is nine years. But they, in the cases they reported that the there is a st it starts as a choroidal lesions, choroiditis, and later it fibrosis. And the progression tends to happen slowly over months. But here I could see that the amoeboid movement happened over one month, two months progression itself. There is no proven hypothesis, why is it, what it is. Though few uh, authors have tried uh, steroids and, uh, and immunosuppressants, but how long can we give the child immunosuppressants or steroids and what to do in such a scenario? So, Sriram, can we put the, yeah. So, comments from the panelists. For how long, sir? She is a nine-year-old child. What, what is it? Sir, once fibrosis, the literature says that once fibrosis has set in, then there is no role of... Is it known to occur in children? And it is progressive. Uh, bilateral symmetrical. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, the, this is usually associated with CNVMs is what uh, one more uh, suggestion is. And this is... Uh, this one, yeah. So whether this is a blood, so because the FFA is not showing. The FFA is not showing yeah. any. So that this is the time when he did an FFA also. So this is the left, I said. This the is the right. right. Ah, yeah. 
So this this age. It's not active leakage as such. Staining, staining minimal staining here. Fibrotic leaching. Yeah. So that yeah. But vision there vision was, no was stabilized yeah. at 624 sir vision in the last is visit. The same so, and OCT is not showing any edema. Heme yeah. uh, Did you do an eosinophil count in this in this patient? Uh, no sir. Well, I did uh, a hemogram, but uh, we did no. not send for a individual. So the child was not at all affording. All these tests were done free of cost. By the rheumatologist. The peripheral fibrosis and the migrating lesion that you are talking about somehow rings a bell. Uh, it could be a nematode infection in the eye, of course, bilateral is rare. Uh, it's DUSN. DUSN, which is DBSN actually. DBSN, okay. Two worms in two eyes. So, can we label it as progressive separate? Uh, she, a physician wants acyclovir to be continued, but I told the parents, see, I cannot help further. The rheumatologist takes a call now. She, she is not able to afford SSA and antivirus. That's what's... <laughs> antivirus. I have to call the patient again and yeah. see now. Now you are Actually, going I was in so Maharashtra. 2022. <laughs> <laughs> you can follow up. Okay. So th th thank you all and uh, thank you for attending and actively participating in our IC. So thank you again the moderators and the panelists and thank you the presenters to provide such in fantastic cases. Yeah. Melanoma. Thank you. <laughs> Diagnosis unknown. Divyansh, that was thank really, you. it was like a mini retinet India. Oh sir, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> sir is not there, I should not take any advantage of that because it's his baby, we are trying to carry it forward sir and yeah. So we would do our best next time also sir. Thank you. Uh, th thank you, sir. <laughs> thank you. Sir, please, uh, everyone can we come on the...